Open our eyes, Lord. We want to see Jesus to reach out and touch him and say that we love him. Open our ears, Lord, and help us to listen. Open our eyes, Lord, we want to see Jesus. Amen. Um, do you guys know uh, what month it is? It's June already. Can you guys believe it? It's already June. How many of you guys feel like uh, this year went by super duper fast for you guys? Okay. How about some of you guys? You felt like it's not going. For, it's it's not December yet. Any of you guys feel like it's super duper slow? Okay, a couple of you guys, but most of you guys, it seems like time has gone by very quick for you. Do you guys know that it's already been one year and a half since I've been here? Right? Doesn't it feel like, okay, maybe for some of you guys here, you guys are like, no, it feels like you've been here forever, right? But maybe some of you guys, it feels like it hasn't been with him that long. Um, I wanted to start off my sermon kind of talking about where our church was and where our church is now. So this is my first weekend here. Uh, 2017 January, so maybe some of you guys, you can see uh, some of you guys there. Okay. This is in 2017, last year. So let me just show you, let me just tell you, um, when I first came here, the status of our church. Number one, we had no board. Okay, we had no leadership. We actually didn't even have a budget. We had no small groups, maybe events here and there, but basically no events, uh, no vision, no diversity. Well, that's not really true. We did have one white person, which is Daniel. Um, but nothing was really going on with this church. Um, but one thing I sensed when I did come here is I felt like we had a core of very, very faithful people people who have really seen the ups and downs of this church. Uh, they've been here when there was a pastor. They've been here when there wasn't a pastor. But there were a core group of people that were willing to say, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stick around. I'm gonna, I want to make sure, even though it's hard, it's difficult, I want to make sure that I see something going on with this church. And even me coming here was, a, I think, an attempt of the leadership to really do that, not to quit, not to say, no, 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 we're just going to fall apart. Even though things are hard and things are not really going on, that we're not going to just stop. Well, where are we at now? We have a board, okay? We have a budget. We have leadership. You guys know that our church is very, very unique because about 80% of our church members actually do something with, to help out. Not, I'm not, when, I, and when I mean by church, I don't really mean um, this building here, but small groups, um, announcements, helping out with different things. We have about 80% of our church members actually contributing and stepping up. And even if it's small things, they're always willing to help out. Now, why is that amazing? Because if you survey all the churches around the world, do you guys know what the average is? It's about 30%. About 30% of church members actually get involved and do things. Our church is 80%. And that's why our church, I think, is very, very healthy. Because we have a group of people who are willing to say, hey, I know that it's hard. I know this is not easy. But... I'm willing to help. 
Even if it's small things, I'm willing to help. And especially with Yam, the fact that they do kids' day, well, that's, that's stressful. That's very, very difficult. Well, for them to even take care of the kids so that the parents could get a breather. I talked to one of the parents. Uh, I had lunch with uh, one of the parents yesterday, and he was really, really thankful for the Yam because he's like, that means so much to me. What else is going on? We have events going on, Fall Fest, Valentine's Banquet. Hey, we actually have diversity now. We actually have, like, like before I used to speak Korean, I had no problem. But now, like, I kind of feel uncomfortable speaking Korean because I feel like, oh, if I say it in Korean, there's going to be people who don't understand. And isn't that great? Isn't that awesome that we're not surrounded just by all Korean. Because I know some of you guys, this might be a shocker, but in heaven, in heaven, just, just letting you know, okay, even, okay there is going to be Egyptians there. Right, Maggot? Praise God, right? Okay. There is going to be Filipinos there, right? No? No? Okay, no? Okay, <laughs> maybe not. It's great. We have uh, diversity. We actually have a building that doesn't smell anymore. Uh, we have a building that doesn't make sounds when you close and open doors. We actually painted all of these things. We actually have like light that we can control. We have small groups going on throughout the week. We have two wives Bible study. We have YAM Bible study. We have a prayer by a small group. We have grow groups or small groups. We, we called it before. Now we have three grow groups. We have one in Carmichael. We have one in Roseville. And we're, we're starting a, a pilot one in UC Davis. And I think most importantly, well, I think all of these things are really, really important. But most importantly, for me at least, I feel like we have a vision. Our church is actually trying to get somewhere. Do you guys remember our vision statement? How many, any of you guys remember our vision statement? What is it? Okay, very, very close, very close. But one word, yeah, yeah, Ava. Oh, okay, good. All right, let's, let's say it all together. To grow relationships that will last for eternity. What a great vision that is. That's an awesome vision that we have for our church. Now, to make you remember this even better, I came up with an acronym, okay? I know it's going to be kind of lame but just stay with me, okay? And you guys are never going to forget it because I'm going to continue to use this word even in our board meetings and even with you guys. So it's going to be girl relationships that last for eternity, right? So it's going to be greatly. You, you kind of get it? You kind of see it? Greatly. To do church greatly. Huh? Uh, okay. Yeah, it says, it says all the YAM members that came up with Almond for our church name. It is really, really exciting that uh, we get to be a church together. I mean, I dreamed of uh, having a church like this, that we can actually really gather together and really love God and love people. It's so awesome and it's so great that people are catching fire, people are wanting Bible study, People are wanting to get closer to God. We even have potential baptisms that's coming up. So I don't know about you guys, but when I reflect upon the past year and a half, there's so many, so many, so many good things. And I don't know about you guys, but I am, I am just so uh, happy. And I'm so, I, words just can't describe uh, what God is doing in our lives. 
But uh, I, I shared this with you guys before. But there is always two fears of mine. Well, actually, it's one, but a second one that I'm, I'm I, I knew that it was going to happen, but I'm fearing a lot more these days. Um, the first thing is, I, and I shared with this with you guys already, um, and I'm going to really speak to you from my heart, but uh, the first thing is, I'm very, very, very scared that we're going to play church and not be a church. Okay? What do I mean by play? What I mean by play is we just come to church to hang out. And not that hanging out and socializing is a negative thing, because that's who we are. That's, that's what humans are. We're social creatures, and that's not a bad thing. But if that's the only reason we do things, if there is no desire for us as a whole church, to really grow relationships that last for eternity, we're going to be playing church. If we're just coming here to church, just because it's the Sabbath, then we're playing church. If there's only one day out of the whole week where you're connecting with God, then most likely you're playing Christianity. And so that's always been my fear. I am so happy, like I said, that we have things going on. I am so happy that people are getting together and getting closer to one another. But my biggest fear is that we're playing church. That when God comes, when God comes, like in Matthew 7, He looks at us and He goes, Who are you guys? And we go, Lord, Lord, didn't we worship in Your name? Lord, Lord, didn't we do stuff for you? And he's like, who are you? Why? Because those people, they were in an illusion. They thought they were a church of God. They thought they were following God. But no. And so that's my biggest fear. My, my biggest fear is, man, I really want to make sure I take every single one of you guys. My biggest fear is I, 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 I want to make sure I can take as many people and lead them to God. And if our church is not doing that, man, what are we doing? Second thing that really fears me, and it's related with the first one, is conflicts. Now, there's a lot more people in here than what we originally had when we first started. So in the beginning, everybody was getting together, everybody had fun, they liked each other, but now we're getting closer and closer, there's more people coming in and out, and we have diversity, and because of that, there's conflicts. <sighs> Past couple of weeks has been really, really, really difficult for me, and again, I want to really speak from my heart. It's been really, really, really difficult for me. Um, it's hard for me because I see, I see people that I'm praying for, uh, people that I really love, and even trying to love, uh, walking away from the faith. Uh, I see people... I see a lot of church members, actually, a lot, a lot of church be, uh, members having miscommunication, being bitter, being resentful, gossiping. I see a lot of church members willing to walk into sin, knowing that it's wrong, living a double life, Knowing that, knowing what is right, but still continuing to sin. It's very, very difficult for me. It takes a lot of, lot of mental and spiritual, it drains me. For the last couple of weeks, man, it's been very, very, very difficult. But I realize also 
that it's not stopping. It's not, it's not, uh, it's not something that we can just say, hey, everybody just love each other, the end. I, I, don't, I don't think it's as simple as that. I think we're a lot more, we're messy, much messier than that. So we're going to start a new series. Uh, I know we haven't finished our prayer series yet, uh, but we're going to put that on a hold for now, and I really want to talk about this. Because I feel like we're getting really good momentum, and a lot of things are going on. But these kind of conflicts, these kind of holding on to our sins, it's going to really break us. Now, The first thing we have to understand about conflicts is that it's very, very, absolutely, absolutely, this is absolutely normal. This is what happens when people get together. Okay? Why? Well, I'll give you two reasons. Two reasons, reality and progression. Okay? Why is conflict, even within the church, a given. Why am I not surprised by this? Again, two reasons. Reality and progression. What do I mean by reality? Number one, the reason why conflicts happen even within the church is because, number one, the reality is we're all sinners. We're all broken. We all got issues that we bring in to this church. And what I mean by, again, church, I don't mean this building, but what I mean is this group. I really, really love all of you guys. Or, okay, once again, I, I really try to, okay? But I don't trust any one of you guys, okay? And again, that might, mean, that might be like, oh, how can you not trust me, Pastor? But the reason why I don't trust you guys is because you guys are sinners. Heck, I'll even take it this far. I don't even trust myself. Actually, I don't trust myself even more than I trust. I actually trust you guys more than I trust myself. Why? Because I am absolutely certain about what kind of damage that I have done, and I am absolutely certain of what kind of damages I can do if uh, if sin was to run free in my life. I know the damage that you guys are able to do, and I know the exact damage that I'm able to do in this church. There's a verse that uh, a lot of people don't like, but this is exactly what Jesus meant. But on Jesus, his, on his part, did not entrust himself to them. Why? Because he knew all people. This is exactly what Jesus is talking about. This is, the, to give you the background, all these people, they're coming to Jesus, they're saying, Jesus, you're awesome. Everything's awesome. Wow, you're healing people. You're teaching us these great things. I'll follow you. I'll die for you. But it says here, this very, it seems very negative almost. God, Jesus, why can't you be pessimistic? Or why, don't, why can't you be optimistic? But no, Jesus seems very pessimistic. He says, no, no, no. It's almost like he puts up a guard and he says, well, I love you guys, but I don't trust you. Why? Because the reality, he knew reality. He knows reality. He knows that we will fight. He knows that we will fall. He knows that we're willing to walk away any minute. Why? Because he knows human nature. Again, look deep inside your heart. You might go, Pastor, come on. Come on, let's, let's be positive here. Just look, at, just look at your life. Imagine if we played a videotape of your life. All the things, all the thoughts that you thought of. All the things that you have done. Imagine, imagine how many people that you have hurt. And you might, have not, you, you might not even know that you hurt them. I talked to a friend recently, and I talked to her and I said, you know, you used to be so much more, like, more bright. Like, how come you seem like so down? And she actually told me that, She's actually going through some um, like mental like uh, disorders as well. Like she has to actually take pills. 
And you know what, what she said? I asked her, like, what's going on? Because I saw her in junior Kayam a long time ago. And I saw her recently, and she said, you know, I had a bully that was, that was really mean to me during junior high. Wait, so that was the reason why you're all dark and you're taking pills now? And she's like, absolutely. Imagine all the people that we've hurt. Imagine all the things that we have done to cause suffering. And we go again, we always go, how come these people on the news, they're so bad, they're so simple? I would never do such a... No. You understand? The reality, the reality of us, deep, deep down, that we're all sinners. And you see, that's why it's not a surprise. It's not a surprise to me it's not a surprise to Jesus, the fact that we have conflicts. Okay? This is going to happen. Do you think we're going to like each other? Absolutely not. Jesus doesn't call us to like each other. He calls us to love one another. And now, this is going to go into another sermon, but we will continue to talk about that. But what I really mean by love one another is really the choice, deliberate choice, despite the feeling to love one another. Okay? Feelings will go up and down. Again, I don't want to bleed into too much of the sermon, but feelings will always go up and down. If you had a bad meal, your feeling will be down. But love, Jesus tells us to love one another. It's a deliberate choice that we make. Why? Because he knows that we're not going to like each other, that we're going to have hard feelings. So that's number one. Don't be surprised if there's conflict. Don't be surprised if you fall into sin over and over and over again. Don't be surprised. Why? Because God isn't surprised. Jesus is not surprised. The only person that that surprises yourself. Do you think Jesus is surprised? Not at all. Why is he dying on the cross? He's not surprised, guys, at your sins. He's not surprised at your mistakes. He's deliberately loving you despite the feelings. And He's dying for you on the cross because of your sin. You're not surprising God. You're only surprising yourself. So number one, conflict, absolutely normal. Why? Because the reality is we're all sinners. We all suck. And we need to acknowledge this. Why? Because if we don't realize that we suck, we're not gonna, we're gonna always think, well, that person sucks, I don't suck, what's her problem? Or what's his problem? You see, that's what we're gonna get to. But if we understand, no, 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 I'm a sinner, no, that person is a sinner, we need to conflict well together. So the reality is, we're going to have conflicts. Number two, the progression. This is one of those things that's really difficult for me, but we have to understand, yes, we are sinners, but we're not just to stay there, right? That there's a progression. There is going forward. We're always getting, we're always trying, or I hope you guys are trying, to every day get closer and closer to God. And that process, theological word, big word I know, it's called sanctification. Okay? That we're not just okay. Yes, God loves us as who we are, but He doesn't just say, no, just stay there, rot in your sin. No, He tells us, go forward. Okay? There is sanctification. Okay? There is a process. There is, you should be getting closer and closer to God. What I mean, what I'm trying to say is, even if you are the most holy person, even if you are praying to God and getting closer to God, there's always going to be failures there's always going to be something wrong. And the best example we see is in the book of Acts. Now, book of Acts, in chapter 2, the disciples, they received the Holy Spirit. 3,000 people that day. 3,000 people get baptized. Okay? And they all receive the Holy Spirit. They're like, I don't care about my material position. I'll sell it all. And I'll give my life to God. 
So amazing things are going on, right? But, but, because a lot of times what we think is, oh, if I really, really meet God, I will never sin. Or, oh, if I really, really receive the Holy Spirit, then I'm never going to fail again. But that's actually not the case. We actually keep falling, and this is what we see in Acts chapter 5, Ananias and Sapphira. What happens? Money issue already comes into the church. And they actually, God actually kills them on the spot. What? Dude, these are people who received the Holy Spirit. These are people that gave everything away. How is it that they have financial problems? How is it that they're hiding money from God? What? Why? Because the reality is we're all sinners. And also, we're continuing to walk towards God, but we're not quite there yet. It's a process. It takes time. Okay? So when conflicts happen, when things happen, you have to understand it takes time. It takes effort. Okay? People don't change just like this. It takes time. We see it again. In chapter 6, there's racial, cultural fights going on. You see it all over the news even now, right? You see racial problems, you see cultural problems. It happened in the church too. Again, these are people who receive the Holy Spirit. They're fighting about our culture is better than your culture. So hey, because we're better, we're not going to feed your widows. Boom. They're having... Problem. They're having conflict. Again, how is it that a, per, a church chosen by God, people who have received the Holy Spirit, they're fighting, they're having conflict. How is it that happens? Because reality, reality is we're all sinners. And the progression is that it takes time. That there's a process. We think, we think for some reason that when we come to church, that we're not going to fight. All of a sudden, we come to church, we're with church people, and we fight with our family members, we fight with our wife, we fight with our kids, we fight with our parents. But so for some reason, we think when we come to small groups, or when we come to church building like this, that we're, never, we're not going to fight. What? It doesn't make sense. What I'm trying to tell you guys is, Again, conflicts happen. Things happen. Why? Because we're all sinners. So what does that mean for us? That means we need to fight well. Okay? And that's why within the Bible, there are so many Bible verses that teach us what to do when their conflict arises. It doesn't just say, avoid conflict. Oh, you guys are holy people. You guys believe in you guys are Christians. You guys believe in God. Oh, good. You're never gonna. No, it doesn't say that. It assumes that we are going to fight. It assumes that we're gonna have conflicts. So, the Bible teaches us, come conflict or fight well instead. Don't fight badly. Fight well. Or what I'm gonna say is, fight greatly. Ah, ah, back to the greatly, huh? Huh? You see, I set you guys up. Fight greatly. Fight so that we can grow a relationship that will last for eternity. Fight greatly. Let's fight well. We're going to have conflicts. We're going to have disagreements. We're not going to like everything that we each other, each other do. But let's conflict. Let's fight well. Why is this important? Why am I... Because I actually had my sermon, and I said, I, I, I have to change my sermon around. Why? why? Why was this so important for me? Because for Jesus, this was so important. Jesus, for Jesus, this was everything. Okay? Two weeks ago, uh, conference president, not president, well, he's not president yet, but conference pe person came, and he gave a sermon on this verse where Jesus prays for us. And what I mean by us, it's really us, not for the disciples, but for the future believers. And do you guys know what he prays? He could pray for a lot of other things, but this is what he prays for. This is what he says. 
the glory that you have given me, I have given to them. That they may be one. Even as we are one. You, me as in God, Jesus. We are one. May the church, the future believers, they become united. They become one. I in them and you in me. That they may become perfectly one. This is so, so important that we conflict greatly. We fight greatly. Why? Because this was God's desire. This is God's deepest prayer, that we unite together. And you might be thinking, I mean, I mean what, why is this so important for Jesus? I mean, why? Ah, he continues, he describes, he, he explains. He says, the reason why we need to unite together the reason why we need to conflict greatly is because why? So. So, he gives a reason. So, that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you loved me. Wait. So, what Jesus is saying here is the reason why we need to conflict greatly, why? Because people will know if we conflict greatly, if we love one another despite our differences, despite our problems, people are actually going to believe what we're going to say. Isn't that crazy? It's not that if you give a great Bible study or if you give a great sermon, people are going to believe. Or that you give the most perfect apologetics or reasoning, that's why people are going to believe. Or you have a great service, you have great for you. That's not what's going to make people believe. But it is when we actually conflict greatly that we're able to still love one another. It's a deliberate action that people are going to believe. Okay, maybe you might go, oh, this is just one verse. I'll give you another one. And it's, it says the same exact thing. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. Okay, now this is a very, very important word. Commandment. He's saying, I command you to love one another. Why is he commanding us? Is it possible he's commanding us because we're not doing it? Okay, why would you command something? Okay, if your kid is cleaning the room, are you going to go, hey, clean the room. I command you. No. The reason why we command people is because they're not doing it. You see, once again, Jesus is not surprised that we're having conflict within the church, within your family, within your work, with your sin, your personal life. You are going to go through conflicts. Why? Because you're a sinner. You're always going to struggle with sin. But once again, he calls us, no, when you are faced with conflict, when our church is faced with problems, we're going to conflict well. We're going to conflict greatly. Remember the reason why? Why? Because if you love one another by this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. See, it's the same thing. Why? Why conflict well? Because people will know God. It is only when we are conflicting greatly that people will be able to say, oh, okay, these are people who are imperfect like me. These are sinners just like me. But they conflict differently. They don't just get bitter and resented towards each other and say nasty things behind people's backs. These are not just people who are okay with their sins. Oh, they do struggle. Oh, Christians are not these perfect No, they're actually just as bad as me, but what? How is it that they're able to still smile through this conflict? How is it that they still have joy and peace? Ah, only if you conflict greatly. Then we're able to be alive. I'll give you an example. Um, I'm surrounded by kids a lot of times because of uh, our Bible studies. And 
it's, it's, it's one of the greatest joys. Because, um, especially when I go to the Korean wives Bible study, uh, the kids, they hear the car um, from the outside. And like Kaylee, Kenzie, Shioni, like they, like they come out in front of the door and they just go like, Moksani! Which means pastor. And they're just so happy to see me. You know, and I'm not a parent. I'm not even their kid. They're not even my kids, but they're just like, oh, they're so cute. But that literally lasts for like five seconds. Why? 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 Let me tell you. So sometimes my wife does the Bible study for me, and so what I have to do is I have to take care of the kids. And let me tell you, they do not conflict greatly. Okay? They don't mess around. They are, oh man, if they had weapons, okay, some of those kids would not come alive. It's very interesting what the parents say, okay? And I hear uh, Gloria, I hear like Tana, I, I hear, you know, especially with toddlers, you can't really reason, reason with them yet. But I always hear them saying this. They said, Camden. Or they go, Minu. Remember, you guys are friends. Remember that if you want to play together, you have to say sorry to each other. That you have to conflict greatly. Okay, they don't say that. But they say you have to forgive one another. You have to get along. Why? Because if you don't, then we have to go home. Because if you don't, you can't play together. Guys, if we don't conflict well, okay, if we're not going to be Christ-like to one another, if we're not conflicting with our sins, then we can't do church together. We can't. We tell our kids this, but as adults, we do the same exact thing. Why? Because kids are sinners and we're sinners too. We're just older. We just think we're more right now. And that person is more wrong. That's it. But we fight about the same thing. We cry about the same thing. We don't conflict very well. Especially in church, we don't conflict very well. But if we really want to do church together, if we really want to grow closer to one another, if we really want our vision statement to come alive, we must conflict greatly. Let me just end with this. Now, you might be thinking, um, I'm scared. I'm scared of the things, what if I say this to this person and they get offended? Or I, I'm scared that it's going to make our relationship awkward. Or I'm, I'm comfortable doing this. But imagine, imagine to just... I know I, I've already passed my sermon time, and let me, let me just do it really quickly. First thing is, imagine because of your conflict, we can't do great things. Because of your conflicts, because of your sins, because of your marital problems, that you're not able to take part of what God is doing in our church. Imagine yourself on the deathbed I'm absolutely certain you're not going to be like, yes, I won the battle against my wife. I'm so happy I won that fight. I'm so happy I held on to my bitterness and my sins. I'm so happy I walked into that one. I'm so glad, even though the Bible or God has convicted me of my sin, that I held on to it. No, you're not going to say that. Can you imagine what kind of detriment that you will be to our church because of your conflict, because of your problems. One of you, just one of you, one of your sins could ruin this church. Well, anybody can ruin this church. Second thing. It's uncomfortable, it's painful, it's unfair. 
That person's crazy. You can't reason with them. And I think this is the ultimate motivation for us, why we need to conflict greatly. Even though we have these feelings, even though we, we hesitate from these things, we need to conflict greatly. Why? Why? And this is really important. Because Jesus did it. And I know that might seem like a cliche answer, but understand this, understand this. It wasn't easy for Jesus. When you say it's uncomfortable, he understands exactly what you mean. When you say I'm afraid, he understands exactly what you mean because why is he crying before he's dying on the cross? He's pleading out to God, I don't want to do this. If you go, that person, I can't reason with that person. That person isn't going to change. What do you think Jesus was going through when he's dying on the cross? Imagine all the people that didn't accept Jesus. Imagine all the people that will not turn their hearts to Jesus. Even though he's dying on the cross, even though he knows that. But he, he doesn't just, he doesn't just, he doesn't just stop there, does he? Instead, he chooses to conflict, conflict or to fight greatly. He says, even though they won't listen, even though they will hurt me, I will still, still fight for them. Why do we need to fight? Why, need, why do we need to fight well? Because that's going to either, we're going to be defined, our church is going to be defined by our conflicts. Oh, it's going to be that oh, Sacramento church. Oh, it's that church that did really well for a year and a half, but there was a big fight. People started gossiping. People started walking into their sins. And nothing happened. Look where they're at now. Or, we are going to be a church that's going to be defined through our conflicts. You can be Christians that's going to be defined by your conflicts, by your sins, by your fights. Or you can, you can become Christians through, through your conflicts despite your conflict. Because these are the things that's going to make us closer and closer to God. So let us fight. Let us conflict greatly. We're going to go into our um, reflection time now. If you could turn on. on. Uh, think about the conflicts that you have, whether it's with sin, whether it's with a person. Uh, Pray to God that God gives you 